Good morning, everyone, and what an amazing tour de force, Heidi. Um, I think uh, <laughs> Heidi could have gone on for another couple of hours, but what an amazing amount of knowledge and an incredible amount of effort across so many areas of, of data sharing. Uh, and I, I think that really goes very well into our, our next panel session, uh, which is looking at collaborating across traditional boundaries, and particularly with a focus on geographic, institutional, and industry boundaries. So I'm just going to give a bit of a preamble, and then we have three panelists um, who will come and give brief talks, and then we'll have time for the old Slido questions at the end. Uh, but I think we're all familiar with all of the boundaries that we need to tackle, uh, whether across data sharing, whether it's around language, whether it's around species, um, whether it's institutional, and uh, the whole role of the Global Alliance is about um, being able to share across these boundaries. So I'm going to give you some examples, obviously, first of all, from my own perspective, is that um, in a, a country like Australia, uh, we have boundaries uh, across states as well um, as a, a federal and state partnership health system that we need to navigate. Um, and when we put together our genomics initiative, uh, it ended up, it's now a partnership of over 80 institutions. Uh, and we have to have um, agreements with every single one of those institutions around the sharing of our data. And we have to um, tackle the ethics and governance across all the different states and the institutions involved, uh, just as an example of one set of barriers that took about 18 months and uh, a couple of million dollars to solve. This is not working. That's not advancing. Ah, there we go. Oops, okay. The next um, boundaries, I, I think this is a, a slide. We've been really looking at how setting up uh, these institutional partnerships um, and particularly setting up an ethics and governance structure that works around the country and is enabling whole of country approaches to different diseases has worked. Uh, and working with our implementation science team, um, we've then been able to look at what are the links that have been created across institutions and across individuals um, over the first two years of the Australian Genomics Program. And I particularly like this slide because it's a sort of a visual representation um, of all the links that have been enabled that's um, tripled uh, over the last couple of years in terms of interactions around the country. Hmm. Uh, I think that Heidi has given um, amazing examples when we talk about uh, matchmaker exchange, for example, as bringing together a whole range of genotype, phenotype databases. Uh, and then BRCA exchange, which was also um, one of the first flagships of the Global Alliance in terms of bringing together all of the variant data um, with expert uh, curation uh, in terms of creating a global resource around pathogenicity in the breast cancer gene. The driver projects approach for the Global Alliance I think has also made a huge difference and the speed dating I, I think is one of the most valuable things that we do where we sit down across all the work streams and actually talk about um, what, we, what we need and what are the tools, what are the standards, such, such as that question that Heidi was asked in terms of uh, you know, what are the standards that we need to develop to promote this. And I think, from again, from our perspective, but, but looking at how we, um, we contribute both at a work stream level, um, then at um, it, it contributing and testing those standards and tools, and then linking in through the national initiatives with other countries to share experience and to learn from others. And, and again, I think this is really breaking down the geographic boundaries and also promoting the using the tools for the sharing of standards. We had a great meeting yesterday that was more of a, a show and tell in terms of what's happening uh, with the National Initiatives uh, Program, which is now bringing together over 20 countries that have national genomics um, initiatives with a focus on precision health. 
And again, this is another way of breaking down those geographic boundaries in terms of implementing our tools and standards and sharing experience. And we now have a number of pilot projects in place where we actually look at sharing high-grade clinical and genomic data um, between countries and how we use all of the different standards developed by the Global Alliance um, along the way. Uh, this is under construction but will be available on the Global Alliance website, is then how do we bring together all of that experience so it's ready to share and how do we have an interface with all of our Global Alliance standards so for the non-geeks amongst us uh, we can make sure we're implementing them appropriately. Uh, and so this, um, this toolbox, which will be a Global Alliance toolbox that's um, I think going to be also going to be available for all new initiatives that are starting around the world uh, where we're really dumping a lot of information into that now and we'll alert everyone when it's ready to use. It will also include um, information, for example, on health economic data that we can use to advocate to our governments in terms of fun funding genomic testing as part of practice. I mentioned that we have a number of projects in place where we're really looking at how we practically map, harmonise and exchange data across our national borders. Uh, I thought that would be easy, but it's, it's actually quite complex. Uh, but there's the team currently, um, we've got a pilot project working between Australian Genomics and Genomics England to just to look at how we put all of the pieces in place uh, and then we will we'll make that available as a schema that can be used across um, across many countries, um, of course, after tackling the regulatory and ethics requirements of the countries involved. And, and similarly, as, as um, Heidi has touched on, and I won't labour this, but really being able to share virtual gene panels. So what are the priority genes you want to look at um, in a specific disease area and how do you um, automate that through the application of a bioinformatics pipeline and the panel app that's been created by Augusto and his team is invaluable for that. Uh, and then finally, fostering industry relationships, which we'll also touch upon. Uh, we've certainly done a lot of work in our country and I, I've um, really reviewed a lot of the literature across a number of different countries around our engagement uh, with the life insurance industry um, and the application of genomic testing. Uh, and we had a great meeting yesterday to start to discuss how the Global Alliance will, will interface going forward uh, with pharma and a number of different um, industries as a partnership because we're enabling a lot of activity that's going to facilitate um, the movement of treatments into clinical practice. So um, with that as a, a starting point, um, we're going to launch into uh, three great speakers that will talk about their experiences in terms of uh, sharing data across the boundaries and, uh, and give us an insight in terms of what has worked and what has not. And um, first, cab off the rank, I'll, I'll get the speakers to come up one by one and then we'll assemble at the end as a panel so you're not all sitting at the stage with everyone looking at you. Um, but the first speaker to come up will be Julia Wilson, uh, who it's been an absolute pleasure to work with over the last couple of years. Um, Julia is Associate Director um, at the Sanger Institute and when I asked her about her job description, she said she just sort of brings together everything genomic in England. Yeah, <laughs> and I was really impressed there. So come on up, Julia. Julia's going to talk about um, the, the partnerships from the, well uh, the Welcome Genome Campus um, and the Sanger Perspective. Yes, so I'm, I'm going to talk today about how we at the Sanger Institute work across traditional boundaries and to increase the reach and impact of Sanger science. And I'm going to give some, um, use some examples, some of which will be very familiar to the GA4GH audience. Some are definitely out of scope, but I just want to illustrate how the tools and standards and the dialogue of GA4GH helps other projects as well. 
So everyone knows the Sanger Institute is a data generation organization. We generate genome sequences, we handle and manage those genome sequences, and we apply them for managing health, for man managing agriculture and the environment. So these offer opportunities in research, in enterprise and in um, innovation, in learning, education and engagement. All of those boundaries that not all of us can pivot between anyway. And so um, the, sorry, my, the, the, yeah, the clicker isn't working. So just to show who is at the Welcome Genome Campus currently, obviously um, the, the main, there are two anchor um, organizations at the Welcome Genome Campus, the Welcome Sanger Institute and the European Bioinformatics Institute. We also have a, a Connecting Science, which serves to uh, take genomes into learning, engagement, uh, and um, and uh, training. And we've got a number of commercial partners who are also based on site, as well as some umbrella organisations and collaborative projects that enable us to, to to pivot and transition between those sectors of academia, commercialisation, and beyond. And all with the theme of genomes and biodata, so there's a, a thread that binds us all together. So when I was asked to prepare this, I was thinking, well, what are the genomic boundaries that we work across? And there's the obvious ones you know, spanning from academia to commercial, academia to healthcare. But there's some other ones that we sort of pivot between all the time. And I'm going to give some little vignettes of, of where Sanger um, crosses these traditional genomic scientific boundaries uh, and the opportunities and the, the pitfalls that we've come across over the years. So the first one is the academic commercial, um, and obviously that's that's a, a real interface to bridge to to see the realization of, of uh, genomics. And the example that we have are, uh, between Sanger, between EBI, and five pharmaceutical partners is the Open Targets Initiative, which is going to be discussed next. So I won't go into a huge amount of detail. But it's a, it's a consortia, it's a public-private partnership, it's in the pre-competitive space, and it's where we're using genomic information to identify and validate drug targets working with the pharmaceutical companies in the hope that we'll get new and better medicines to patients using genomics. So that, that's the next talk, so I won't steal any thunder from the next speaker. Then the next, the, the next cultural or sort of genomic scientific boundary that we have to cross is the one between academia and healthcare. And Catherine's had a fantastic initiative over the last four years of bringing together the uh, national projects that uh, various countries have, bringing them together, sharing best practice, using GA4GH tools. That was a separate session yesterday. So I want to use a different example again from, from the UK, which is Health Data Research UK, which again is spanning between academia and healthcare. Health Data Research UK is headed up by Andrew Morris, who's a great champion and friend of Global Alliance, and he's also insists that everything that HDR UK does uses GA4GH tools and standards and best practice that we, we've learned over the last few years. And HDR UK has been established in the UK, it's government funded and charity funded, to liberate routinely collected healthcare information and make it available for scientists to use for research. And these are some slides I've stolen from Andrew Morris, but just to show the, the, the data landscape within the health system in the UK, it's very complicated and nobody really knows how to navigate through it. And then on the, the right-hand side of the slide are the other uh, agents and players in the UK landscape who also wish to use these data for research or have data of their own as well. And the premise of HDR UK is to um, liberate new data sets that can be applied to biomedical research and to create new technologies and platforms where this data can be aggregated and um, presented to the, to the community and bringing together the health data, the research community and the results that happen then feed back into the health care, healthcare system and Im improve the healthcare system ultimately. So we're very privileged uh, that we were selected as one of the sites, there's six national sites in the UK for Health Data Research UK. 
Our site is a partnership between the Wellcome Sanger Institute, uh, Emble EBI, the University of Cambridge and our local hospital trust. And naturally, our, our premise is to bring sort of longitudinal genomic cohorts and link these together with routinely collected healthcare information and electronic health records. And the value of um, liberating this data for research, research can't be underestimated. Just this, you can see the, the numbers on that slide. That's the data accrual of just the hospital that we're connected with and the amount of information that we can be um, unleashing to the research community and improving patient outcomes ultimately. The next boundary I want to talk about is when academia gets involved in government and national strategy. And the example I'm going to use here is UK Biobank, which has been mentioned on this platform during this meeting. UK, uh, UK Biobank is a 500,000 participant cohort, deeply phenotyped, and has been going for um, many, many years and is, is a rich source of information for, for researchers. A government review of the last few years and the resulting life sciences industrial strategy that was developed outlined the need to genome sequence, whole genome sequence this, the UK Biobank cohort to make it an even more valuable resource for the community. And Sanger, along with Decode, were selected to deliver that whole genome sequencing for, for UK Biobank. It's a time-limited, 27-month uh, uh, project with funding from UK government, from Wellcome, and four pharmaceutical companies to fund the whole, hum the whole genome sequencing of these participants. So we have 27 months to deliver 225,000 genomes, including uh, variant calling and um, making and uh, getting the data back to, to, to the organization. And so the boundaries that we're working across here are the ability to scale to such to, to, to that delivery. Um, there's also the boundary between working to milestones and a government contract and the, acad the academic ethos that we may have as well. But you can see the value that we're going to unleash with this, this uh, data ultimately. I also wanted to, to talk very briefly about uh, crossing species boundaries, and I know this is completely out of scope for GA4GH, um, and I'll just use an, um, an example of the Centre for Genomic Pathogen Surveillance, which is a non-profit entity uh, within the Sanger Institute, which um, uses whole genome sequencing of uh, pathogen isolates, and that can be at a local level, a national level, or an international level. The strains are sequenced, information is gathered, gathered about them, and then they're fed back to, um, to national or international disease control um, organizations. And I know one of the next speakers is talking about crossing species barriers, so I'll just briefly touch on this one as well. So we're not only crossing species barriers, but we're also often crossing jurisdictional barriers and geographical barriers. And so the need to partner with uh, umbrella organizations, non-governmental organizations, national control programs to make sure that this data can flow and in a timely and relevant fashion and can be used um, to, for accurate decision making uh, at government level. And that's another boundary that we, we're increasingly interfacing with to enable the uptake and utility of, of genomics. Also to say on the, the subject of species, and this is way off GA4GH scope, but to give you the Earth Biogenome Project, which is a, a global effort to sequence the one and a half million eukaryotic species in the world over the next couple of decades. And so we in the UK decided, well, yeah, we, we, we can do that. So we cr we've created the, the UK Darwin Tree of Life project, which aims to sequence the 70,000 known, known eukaryotic species in the UK. Um, and we've set ourselves an ambitious timeline as well. And you can see, obviously, as always, Sanger will always partner with the European Bioinformatics Institute because we're, we're stronger together. But you can see we've got some quite unusual bedfellows for, for the Sanger Institute here. But it just shows the, the excitement of coming together and delivering something at the, frontier, the real frontier of, uh, of genomics currently. 
Um, there are many challenges. We want to sequence the first 2,000 of these in the next couple of years. Uh, we know we've got challenges. We've got scale. We've got long read. We've got assembly challenges and regulatory challenges as well. Um, and we need to be able to scale to be doing about 20 new genome sequences every day. So, but uh, an extraordinary effort and completely new new partners with new ways of working. Just to give you a little vignette about the challenges that you would have here. We did a pilot project of sequencing 25 genomes uh, for our 25th anniversary, and we thought we'd stick with UK species only because there's no Nagoya um, regulations. And unfortunately, we, we had decided to sequence an invasive species, the New Zealand flatworm, and our advisory board suggested that we contact Genomics New Zealand because they might be a little bit interested in what we're doing with the New Zealand flatworm. That led to lots of discussions with the Maori Council and some really fruitful discussions and potential student collaborations and some amusement that, that, um, that New Zealand had managed to get a pest into the UK because it was usually the other way around. But this um, demonstrates that you know, this was only one invasive species that we... we, we um, that we used, and we will have to, we'll, we'll have to probably scale this and, and use this to have some, some more useful conversations. My final example is how we work with our partner organizations on site, and we have an innovation center where we have commercial partners, and they, have a, they come through a, a, a gateway policy that they have to have a strategic fit, and they have to want to collaborate, and they have to want to give back, and we hope that good collaborations will happen. But at the same time, we realise that our, you know, just putting academic scientists next to uh, commercial entities doesn't mean that, um, that collaborations will flow. So we also have to train our scientists to, to get, give them the skills that they can pivot between sectors, between academia and industry. And so we have a process of mentoring and training so we can deliver not only the next generation of genome scientists to the world, but they're also trained in being able to pivot between sectors as well. So that's why I want to talk. GA4GH obviously do cross many of these boundaries as well, and I've added technological boundaries there. GA4GH are constantly working between these boundaries and bringing this community together. Um, and so we can navigate between these, th these systems. And that's why this is so, GA4GH is so useful and why we, we talk about it to our partner organizations and get the, the tools and the best practice utilized. And you can see that even when we're moving beyond GA4GH boundaries, we still find the tools, the standards, the principles, and the value of um, a value to deliver, to help us deliver our science. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Julia. It's, it's amazing scale that you're talking about there as well. Uh, and I, I think, you know, just these, Heidi's talk, your talk, seeing what is happening at scale is, is incredible. Uh, and we're now moving on to talk about uh, a focus on industry partnership and looking at, uh, particularly at drug targets. Um, Ian Dunham was, was going to speak but unable to attend from England, so we went to the top and you and Bernie will be taking his place. All right. So I'm going to uh, channel my inner Ian and I hope he's watching on live stream at the moment, so Ian, get better, or whatever is uh, keeping you in England. Um, so, uh, and I hope I do justice uh, to your slides, uh, Ian. So this, as uh, Julia mentioned, this is about a open, um, uh, a pre-competitive academic industry partnership that's been running for over five years. Um, and the partnership is really focused on on a really key part of drug discovery. That is that many of the decisions in drug discovery are made very early on, in particular which target do you attempt to drug. But those decisions have big consequences on this very, very costly part of the end part of drug discovery. So you make decisions 10, 15 years beforehand. If you make those decisions incorrectly, you can be spending billions, wasting billions of dollars at the end of the pipeline. 
Um, this is uh, described as failures, so failures in phase two, that's the first time a drug is tested in a clinical setting, or failures in phase three, that is the phase where the drug is really put through its paces against other standard treatment, and the final submission goes to the regulatory authorities. And the key thing on both of these things is the, the number of failures which are due to efficacy, 51% in phase two, and 66% and, uh, in phase three. Efficacy basically means the drug is not actually changing the disease. And that is very, very often due to the fact that they've made a perfectly good drug that changes the activity of a protein or a process, but that protein or process is not actually involved in the disease that they thought was going on. And so this relationship between which proteins should you drug to affect which disease, it's called target identification, or sometimes target validation, is a key process. Um, so uh, so uh, there's many, many different steps in making a drug. This target identification comes very, very early. One then goes through usually very complex chemistry or antibody or other modality drug making. And then you go over into the clinical side of showing that it works. But that key target question happens early. So this is what this partnership aims to solve. It aims to significantly shift the probability of making a wrong decision at this early stage. It is a public-private partnership of uh, these members here, so GSK, uh, Ember EBI, Takeda, the Wellcome Sanger Institute, um, uh, Sanofi, Celgene, and Biogen. Um, they all bring different pieces of expertise to the table. Even inside of drug companies, they have different focuses, but they also have different skill sets about how they think about the process. So they are very, very different in, in, in both their approach and their focus. And then uh, the two academic institutes bring very complementary uh, uh, skills. So the Wellcome Sanger Institute is, as Julia mentioned, a large-scale data generation institute and can really move some serious uh, bits of genomics. And at Embel EBI, we focus on data and understanding data. So we bring um, uh, uh, a variety of different methods to solve this problem. So high throughput human genetics, in this is a, it's a much talked about thing of using genetics to improve which targets you use. You have to be quite skilled in understanding how you combine data sets and execute them. But also a high throughput cellular genetics and other uh, CRISPR models uh, and ways of investigating um, uh, using uh, these techniques to investigate cellular processes directly. This is coupled with the um, comparisons and integration of data uh, across all of the EBI databases focused on this one question, uh, is this target really involved in this disease? We make all of our data open. Um, so this is open to the world. Um, and so in some sense for the companies, this is as much a de-risking process uh, of, of pooling their um, efforts with us, the academics, together. It's open in the sense that the companies participate directly in the projects. So like all scientific projects, they are involved from the very start, and therefore, in effect, they are seeing things a year or two years before a final uh, publication. Um, it's been extremely interesting bringing these two cultures together. I have really appreciated the value of good project management uh, by being involved in open targets. It has been a complete education for me in the value of really, really good project management, for example. Uh, and at the same time, I think the industry uh, side has really appreciated just the sheer innovation, the, the willingness to tear things up and do things from a fundamentally different starting point that many academics bring. Uh, to this. So we're actually quite a big uh, system. Uh, we've got quite a good fusion of our commercial and academic 
uh, culture. So just some thoughts about this. This has now been running for some time. So Ian, um, who is the um, uh, director of Open Targets, now has quite a good way of, of thinking about this. So there's a kind of idea collection phase where people put in expression of interests and the central office sort out what they can, um, uh, what things are overlapping, what places they can see synergies, what are the missing gaps to this. Um, and then they bring the people they think should be brought together together. And that's a very proactive process. So again, rather unlike academic processes, which is very often bottom up, investigator driven, there's quite a lot of deliberate engineering of who should be in the same room uh, discussing uh, the topic. And then um, uh, Open Targets commits to projects, and those projects have funds, but they also get project managed. And so, again, for academics, this is a little bit interesting because, you know, somebody actually asks you, this is what you were going to do. Are you actually doing it? Um, uh, uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a good fusion of these two uh, cultures. Um, there's a kind of scientific loop here of uh, flip-flopping between informatics projects and experimental projects. So both of these are kind of first-class projects in our universe of open targets. So the dry work is as important and as innovative as the wet work. Here is a, a, a really transformative example. This was doing a whole genome CRISPR screen on 324 cell lines, cancer cell lines. These cancer cell lines have been fully genomically characterized and actually been characterized in a variety of ways, including drugs. Uh, as well, drug response. And so in these whole genome CRISPR screens, which is not the easiest thing to do, they were able to test not just one cancer line, but many cancer lines to look for cases where you could see a genetic lesion and a CRISPR knockdown giving synthetic lethality. And so that's shown on the right-hand side here, in this case about colorectal carcinoma um, cases, the things like KRAS in some sense are positive controls, but there are new, very clear targets from this robust multiple cell line experiment gone through with uh, good um, uh, informatics. So this goes uh, also on to uh, the other component that we deliver is a comprehensive integration of this data for scientists mainly scientists working in drug discovery, both in commercial settings and in academic settings. And here we have invested very a lot in not just having the right information, but making sure scientists can consume that information well. Now, this is something that is now much more instinctive, but inside of the EBI. But Open Targets has been one of the places that have taken this very, very... Um, systematically of, of the academic process or the research process of understanding what does your user want and then when you have web pages what does the user think is going on in those web pages and what you learn from this is that bioinformaticians and the people who design the web pages we are not very good at understanding this because we know what the information is. So when we look at the web page, we're like, I understand this. I made the web page. So there is this moment where you have to learn that the people making web pages are the worst people to assess whether the web pages are actually delivering uh, the result. And actually, interestingly enough, a lot of this happens with pen and paper. Um, um, and interviews, not with uh, websites. The websites are a very late process uh, uh, in this. So it's, much, it's very focused on what information do I want to see. And I please go to this platform if you haven't. It's a real pleasure, actually, uh, to use because of this user um, uh, experience work. Uh, so targetvalidation.org. Um, type in your favorite gene, your SNP, uh, or your phenotype and uh, explore. 
Um, the other feature that has come through again and again has been the utility of human genetics. This is work not done um, uh, in, uh, directly in Open Targets, but by GSK, showing the improvement in successful drug uh, uh, phase three trials when you integrate human genetics. And it's very strong. It's one of the strongest pieces of evidence that your target is correct when you can line up human genetic evidence behind that target associated with that disease. Um, and this uh, is, has all the complications of uh, human genetics. In this case, looking uh, at, for example, integrating um, uh, GWAS with expression QTLs. In this case, on the right-hand side, um, there's a drug uh, that was made uh, against one of the targets in this region, and that drug actually ended up being unsafe. Whereas here, where the genetic signals are correct um, uh, uh, for, this for this target relationship, that drug is um, e efficacious uh, and used. Um, specifically, genetics is actually quite complicated uh, uh, with all these different data sets. And so um, uh, we have Open Targets has a, a specific genetics portal to look at that genetics.opentargets.org. Actually, for my own research, this is my first port of call now to understand a, a SNP or, or, a, or a gene uh, with respect to human genetics. So here, Ian um, built, they, they reviewed the impact of Open Targets and they looked at. Uh, some of the benefits um, at the top, uh, the, the uh, uh, x-axis are, are, goes from unexpected benefits through to expected benefits. Um, and then uh, the y-axis is things that one can measure to things which one is a more like a qualitative result. So the top right was why open targets was set up. New targets from experimental projects. It's a very hard uh, endpoint, and they could really measure um, uh, how many of these uh, came through. But you can see there's all sorts of uh, unexpected benefits. So, for example, simplifying safety workflows just wasn't on the agenda at the start of Open Targets, but ended up being a big, there's quite a big impact from the work of Open Targets into these companies. And here, Ian's laid out um, some of the perspectives that the two sides bring. And it, it, you know, it's one of these classic crossing boundary situations where the mistake is to think one group of people is cleverer than the other group of people. This is obvious. Uh, you know, making drugs is very hard and very complicated. Doing academic research is hard and complicated. And unsurprisingly, the people who are good at it are clever. But you have to kind of get over that a little bit and realize that you're uh, in a situation of, of peers. But those peers bring different perspectives. So the academics um, uh, have different drivers. For example, very, very interesting uh, driver being intellectual contribution and being recognized for their intellectual contribution, uh, for example, with papers. But for industry, they really, really want a result that works. They want something that changes the dial for their own internal processes. And that is really quite a different thing. And so merging and, and aligning these drivers has been a, a key part of uh, Open Targets' um, uh, um, uh, system. So um, Open Targets has been a real success. Um, we have uh, more than 50 interlinked projects to implicate targets. Uh, for me, it's been transformative to see how a true public-private partnership can work. This is not just industry giving money to do something. It is a joint effort between industry and academia to achieve a goal. Um, and I think the thing that we're very, very proud of is uh, uh, the project data being used by partners, uh, seeing that go in, as well as the data and the good science that's come out of it. Uh, but it's been useful on both sides of, of the system. 
So here's a picture of the Open Targets team. That is Ian in the in the big flowery shirt at the front uh, with his uh, with his key team and all the people from all these different organisations uh, involved in Open Targets in one of the um, uh, all hands days. So that's uh, that's that's me. Thanks so much, Ewan. And our third speaker, um, uh, third and last speaker for the panel before questions is Bronwyn McInnes. Uh, and we did mention as one of the um, traditional or less traditional barriers is across species genomics. And um, Bronwyn is the Associate Director of Malaria and Viral Genomics in the Broad Institute um, and also co-leads their multidisciplinary global health initiative. Uh, and I, I wouldn't say, Julius thought that, said that infectious disease is outside scope of the Global Alliance, but, but I think we're actually really um, realise how incredibly important this is and uh, are bringing it within scope. So over to you, Bronwyn. Yes, thank you very much um, to the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you, and thanks to Julia, wherever you are, for setting the stage for this talk. Julia apologized for showing two slides on pathogen genomics. I am not going to apologize for making you listen to an entire talk about it. I'm actually really looking forward to your engagement and feedback. Can I just check? How do I? Green. Green button. Perfect. Okay. So um, I am here representing um, most immediately the Broad Institute, but really a global alliance that is forming around the application of genomic data to the real world problems of pathogen surveillance and outbreak response. Um, and this, I should say, say from the beginning, is done very closely with our partners and colleagues at the, at the Sanger Institute. A full disclosure, I was at Sanger for seven years before I came to the Broad, so I'm really bringing these worlds together and, uh, and, and really bringing this technology, I think, to the world together. So, there we go. So I think it's fair to say in terms of, this also just, oh, perfect, thank you. <laughs> uh, these things are so tall. Um, in terms of near real time, whole genome sequencing, the first demonstration of the value of this type of data to not only understanding what's going on in, in the context of an outbreak, but actually helping to guide the public health response to it was during the 2014 Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which I'm sure you can remember ravaged the region and really had the entire world on high alert. Um, we were working, uh, my colleagues at the Broad were working um, in Kanama, Sierra Leone, for about a decade before Ebola came to the region. And as we realized that the virus was on the doorstep of Kenema, we sent uh, PPE to protect, personal protective equipment to protect our colleagues and their communities as much as we could in the, you know, uh, hopeful event that, or the, uh, hoping that the virus wouldn't come to Kenema, but um, in the event that it did. And we also sent PCR-based, just PCR primer, molecular diagnostics to help inform um, diagnostics since most of the, the diagnoses were being made based on symptoms alone. And so here you can actually see one of our colleagues, Augustine Goba, uh, diagnosing one of the first cases of Ebola using PCR primers. Um, and that was, was actually pretty kind of technological. At the time, there wasn't whole genome sequencing in West Africa. In fact, there wasn't whole genome, genome sequencing really happening on the continent very much at that time. Um, unfortunately, Ebola came in a, in a massive way to Kenema. It was one of the hardest hit regions. And we lost several colleagues to the disease. Um, but we did learn something. I think one of the silver linings of the Ebola outbreak in 2014 was that it really galvanized the community, the public health community, the research and development community, to think, what can we do better next time? And one of the things that's emerged from that experience, really, is the application of genomic data to understanding and informing outbreak response. And so here you're just looking, here you're looking at whole genome data from 99 Ebola clinical samples that were at the time sent back to the Broad for whole genome sequencing. And what we learned from doing this in, in near real time was that unlike, uh, in contrast to what was the uh, kind of dogma that uh, the, the virus had been, was being propagated by multiple introductions from the environment, 
In fact, the, the outbreak was being sustained by human-to-human -human transmission, multiple uh, 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 interactions between healthcare workers and between people looking after their families. And so, excuse me, um, these data alone actually helped to change the public health messaging around the outbreak, um, switching from, not, from avoiding contact with meat and with with uh, bats, one of the presumed reservoirs in the environment, and uh, to uh, promoting hand washing and personal protection. And so that's just one kind of ad hoc example of how this data was used. And now here you're looking at the kind of entire spectrum of genomic data that was generated during the Ebola outbreak. This, was, um, uh, this is about 1,600 samples from about six different groups. And, and there's a lot of data if you really drill in here, but the main point is to say that these genomes evolve in, uh, you know, sufficiently quickly that the information in the, the mutations and the evolution is significant and, and useful in real time. And it just provides a, a massively kind of powerful information source that has been previously untapped to understand what's going on and, and drive um, on the ground activities. And so, I mean, without going into all of the details of, of what the different kind of use case applications are, you can imagine this can help inform diagnostics and vac vaccine design in real time, knowing exactly what the kind of up-to-date version of the viruses are that you're, that you're dealing with. It can help identify sources and sinks to target interventions appropriately. It can, um, it can kind of radically uh, rethink the way that we undertake contact tracing, which is typically done by taking travel history, um, which is, is notoriously kind of incomplete and messy. But the, using the genomic information itself, we can reconstruct the transmission chains. And those are just a few examples. And while this paper that came out in 2017 that integrated all of this information was interesting in and of itself, I think it's obvious that the real power of doing this is when the data come in real time and when it's shared openly across country borders to inform the picture of what's going on and to inform the outbreak response. And so this, I think, has this and, you know, many other kind of somewhat academic, somewhat ad hoc um, applications and observations of the power of genomic data have to, together created a movement um, in, in the public health space that we're calling precision public health, bringing the power of pathogenomic data to pathogen surveillance and outbreak response. And I borrowed this slide from, from Peter because I think it really illustrates um, where we are. This is, is definitely a continuing learning circle between the pathogen genomics communities and all of the kind of associated um, uh, research endeavors around that, um, and public health communities. And by that, I mean um, ministries of health in, in governments, ministries of inf information, ministries of interior in multiple country governments. Um, the, the World Health Organization, uh, many global policy advisors and funders. And just to clarify for this audience, the, um, the main kind of uh, information that we're serving here is not patient-facing, we're not returning clinical data or genomic data to inform clinical decision-making on a patient-by-patient -patient level. It's return of results for the purpose of guiding larger scale interventions, like where do, do, do I deploy drugs, where do I try to break contract or transmission chains, um, and how do I know where the sources of these, uh, these pathogens are coming from to, to disrupt or prevent introduction. Um, and these are, these are huge decisions, especially for poor countries. You know, these are very resource intensive, you know, even billion dollar decision making in, in terms of, of large scale global drug distribution and knowing, you know, the genetic underpinning of the outbreak or, or, or of the endemic disease that's circulating gives a, a radically new look into, uh, into how to make those decisions uh, in a very kind of data driven and effective way. So just to say that we've, I think it's, you know, it's fair to say that we've moved past the point where this is an academic undertaking. It's, uh, we're past the point where it's, uh, you know, people in academic centers trying to convince the world of the, the value of this data. But instead now we're actually being asked for it 
And these are just kind of three examples of three different layers where this is true, um, working with the, the Nigerian CDC um, during the Lassa fever outbreak last year, where genomic data really underpinned um, their, their strategy for controlling that, understanding, first of all, what was going on during the Lassa outbreak and, and their control strategy. The World Health Organization, who is taking a leadership role in, in socializing the idea of genomic data with the country level stakeholders and helping to get buy in for, uh, for data sharing at the country level. And then, of course, the, the Gates Foundation, who is, is a major supporter of this work. So, as you, I'm sure you can imagine, there are many challenges in doing this, many of which are familiar to this audience and some that are are somewhat unique, I would say. The first is to say that I think um, if there's one thing that, that this room can agree on, it's that you all work on human genomes. And if there's one thing that's true of pathogens and outbreaks, um, they're not only are we talking about multiple species, we're talking about the entire, in, even beyond the, the tree of life, with, with viruses, with bacteria, and with eukaryotic parasites and other um, infectious bugs. And so th that presents, you know, you can imagine the challenges in terms of kind of the technical aspects of the, the genomics and the standardization, but it, it also means that for every pathogen, for every disease, and for every outbreak, you're often dealing with a different bug, a different community of researchers, a different community of, you know, government and, and operational partners, um, and that is, is the, the, the need for collaboration and trust between those stakeholders um, is all the more relevant in the time of crisis and all the more difficult to achieve. Um, then in terms of resourcing and resource inequities, unfortunately the reality is that for, in many cases the most relevant, um, you know, affected populations are in low resource settings. And as powerful as genomic data is, it's still a relatively expensive data type to generate compared to case counts, for example. Um, and so there is the need, you know, to come up with probably a new business model for being able to deliver real-time genomic data in some pretty challenging contexts and very low resource environments where every decision of, of what tool to deploy comes at the cost of not doing something else. Um, in terms of the partnerships, you know, a lot of this is still being driven by long-standing academic research partnerships, and there are issues around the, you know, the resource um, discrepancy and, and, and the kind of apparent power discrepancy that comes with that resource imbalance, and so finding ways to um, promote all of the stakeholders in, in doing this um, to, to be equal partners and, and be perceived that way is a critical piece of this. And of course, there are significant capacity building needs, um, which I'll touch on in the next slide. Uh, but, you know, the bringing sequencing to the continent of Africa and to some other challenging environments around the world is no um, easy task, let alone the, the, all the infrastructure around that in terms of data analysis and data sharing. And then, of course, on the point of sample and data sharing, um, I think we could have an entire talk on this point alone, but it, I think f from the perspective of, you know, historical kind of academic data sharing, there has been the tension between, you know, I want my postdoc to be the first to analyze this data um, versus the public good of sharing the information widely and in real time, pre-publication, where it can have the most value. Um, but it, we, we're kind of moving to another level where even w where we have on the whole, you know, greater, better buy-in for open academic data sharing, there's a complete new game around country-level data sharing. These are sovereign nations, these are bugs that, you know, are on their soil, so to speak, um, and and in many cases, there is just a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding of what we mean, what, the, what are the implications of sharing data about, you know, very dangerous path pathogens that are circulating within a country. Um, and, and, it, and it's an interesting situation because the countries themselves could benefit the most by sharing the data, but in many cases they're afraid to or, you know, just don't really um, understand the implications. 
And so it's a, an effort to socialize these ideas and bring those, those governments. And it's often not the ministries of health who, who if anyone, are the most you know, willing to, to, to do that. It's the Ministry of Information who's never heard of genomic data who has to sign off on this. And so it's just a, a massive kind of uh, uh, socialization and, and training exercise to bring those up to speed. And, and then finally, the, the risk of benefit sharing, that you know, if I share my data, will, will uh, first world countries come back and sell me drugs, sell me diagnostics based on that that I then need to pay for? So those are just some of the issues, but I'm happy to say that we're making progress. And again, the solutions in this space are mostly familiar and somewhat unique. Um, as I mentioned, the WHO is really taking a great leadership role in helping us to move the ball on, on developing data sharing guidelines and normative guidance um, with countries. And so that's uh, been a, a tremendous help in, in moving that forward. Um, groups like us and at Sanger and, and many others are establishing local, local capacity for, 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 uh, for whole genome sequencing um, in some of these most vulnerable countries. I'm happy to say that the ASCID network, the African Centers of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases, is one of the H3 Africa driver projects, um, and uh, that's a group that we work very closely with. I'm also happy to say that we've established whole genome sequencing in four countries in West Africa, including uh, Sierra Leone, um, and more and more, including in the current uh, Ebola outbreak in the DRC, we're using mobile minion sequencing to bring the, the technology as close to the outbreak as possible. So where we are now, um, you know, I think you kind of have the sense where it's a lot of academic, uh, pathogen genomics research groups trying to bridge uh, the connection to, to, uh, to public health. Um, and, and we're looking now for how we can standardize, how we can build consensus, how we can develop data sharing agreements, and, and really looking to you all for guidance in doing that. Um, so we've started a, a, a formal kind of alliance, a consortium around this called Public Health Alliance for Genomic epidemiology, it probably looks very familiar in terms of its purpose around developing consensus standards, uh, best practices, improving access, improving um, openness, interoperability, all of the things that you guys spend a lot of your time doing. And just to take the, the analogy a little further, we have an acronym, we had to work that four in there somewhere, so, so we call this phage, a little play on J4GH and a little play on uh, on pathogen, you know, uh, entity. So, um, and I, I figured I couldn't give this talk without having one of these charts, which is completely unofficial. <laughs> I came up with this last night, um, but this is, I think, where we hope we're going. We have established um, technical work streams, which, you know, are listed on the left. I don't need to go through them because we've pretty much you know, taking them from you all, and then some very real-world um, uh, driver projects around outbreak responses I've described, but also around malaria elimination and the spread of, of malaria drug resistance and um, drug resistance TB. Um, so this is all work to be done. This initiative is being formally launched next week at the Gates Grand Challenges meeting in, in Ethiopia, um, and we truly look forward to continued partnership um, going forward and hope to uh, maybe become a J4GH driver project eventually. Thank you. I'll take Chairman's prerogative and we'll have eight minutes of questions, so please hit with your slidos. Um, and I, I really just want to emphasise as people are coming up, um, these amazing initiatives and at their core is doing so much stuff in a pre-competitive space and, and really getting over those boundaries um, in terms of data sharing and recognising that when we're all focused on for the benefits of human health, um, really having um, that very open data sharing at the core of everything we do is so important. So, um, just to take first question, what is the IP policy for targets submitted to open targets? Ewan, can you take that question? Yes, so um, kind of a, a, a sort of assumption in the system is that there's very little IP on targets. That is that you can't patent 
uh, gene association with disease. And that's slightly disputed, or, or people do take those patents, but all the people who participate, the companies that participate in open targets, focus their intellectual property on the molecules to interfere with targets, so on the chemistry, on the antibodies, on those things, which is much, much harder IP. And we have a very, very careful line that polices the, uh, uh, where this ends uh, so, so that the companies all understand how that works. It is a complicated domain. It is something that, for example, we have just been looking at revising to ensure that the companies do not lose the freedom to operate um, uh, for the, the targets that are produced. So freedom of operating, freedom, freedom to operate is probably the most important concern for the companies rather than, rather than uh, uh, acquiring exclusive IP. But very often to achieve freedom to operate, you need to use quite a lot of IP law or, or IP thinking uh, in it. Thank you. Um, the, the second question I'm going to throw to you, um, Julia, is can you, uh, I mean, we've talked about the importance of sharing and we're obviously all here because we're carers and sharers. Um, but what, uh, you know, why do you think sh the concept of sharing is so big in genomics? This is from someone uh, that's from a different domain. Well, I think genomics was always an open science from the very outset when um, there was a competition to keep that first human genome in the public domain. Um, and, and so as a culture, we grew up sharing data from the outset. So for us, it's normal to be sharing data constantly with, collabor with collaborators because there's so much information, we can only capitalize on part of it. So the rest of the community needs to have that data to be able, we can pass that baton on and they can do things we can't even imagine with that data. My, my sense also is that uh, it's, it, it's very, in, it's increasingly rare that a person in isolation is going to make a big discovery because you need to share. And secondly, the discovery of a new disease gene is not what it used to be five or ten years ago. And just going back to, to Heidi's talk and the reason people wouldn't put variants, um, variant level information in Nomad, uh, you know, it it's just makes no sense. Um, Bronwyn, we're just delighted at how you've adopted the spectacular um, roadmap model for Global Alliance um, to Infectious Disease. Um, and uh, I must say we'd be delighted to work with you. And but um, the the question that came to you was uh, that came for you was um, which global alliance standards are your first focus? Oh. How can we're here to help, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great to hear. I should say I hope that there's no like copyright on <laughs> your slides and ideas because we've pretty much stolen them all. No, we don't share. We don't <laughs> share our strategic plan. <laughs> so, I mean, there's so many levels to answer this question. I think, you know, at the broad level, we need the ethos of G4GH to penetrate you know, the communities that we're working across to bring them all into the same conversation because they're so fragmented, even though they all share a common purpose really in, in using this data for, for the global good. Um, and so I think having, you know, the ecosystem to, to have these conversations and develop standards and, and best practices is, is probably paramount to getting this really going. Then. More specifically, I mean, aside from just the framework in the slides that I showed, I think there's, uh, you know, a, f a few things that are, you know, very concrete things that we'd love to just, you know, poach from, from you guys in terms, in, in particular in terms of standardizing um, workflows and APIs to, you know, I think some of the cloud compute APIs we would like to advocate that we just make those, you know, an official part of our roadmap right from the beginning to, to be able to standardize across you know, even within pathogen genomes, across groups who are doing the generating data and doing analysis, and then across genomes to have standard, across, you know, species and, and pathogens to have uh, standards. Because I think not only from the genomics point of view, but from when you convert that information, um, you know, public health officials don't care at all about pathogen, you know, genomic variation. They want to know where do I send my drugs? How do I deal with this outbreak? And we need to, t to distill from, you know, the genomic data down to very simple, um, actionable information. 
um, with confidence that we got it right from the beginning, you know, that the data analysis um, is robust. And, and I think the, the standards um, and the concept of developing these standards that you, um, that you work towards will be critical in being able to make this, you know, robust and codified and deployable. Thank you. Um, Ewan, there's a big, big question up the top there um, that is probably one of the big traditional barriers that we need to surmount is the language barrier of a yeah. global organisation solution? So I'm very lucky that my native language is also the international language of science, uh, which is English. It wasn't always English. If you go back 100 years, it was, it was German. Um, so I, I know that I am very, very lucky um, uh, that I'm very fluent um, in this language. I don't think we're going to change the fact that humans, when they communicate, they have to have a common language. We have to choose one. I'm not sure English is necessarily the best, but I, I, it is the one there. But what I think we should do, and we should do far, far more, is make it easier for our information to go out into the places where English isn't used, because it's not everybody's national language, so that's healthcare, and so the translation of HPO terms into Japanese uh, by Sochi uh, was a great example of that. But also to make sure that we're very, very um, inclusive in the way we set these things up. Um, and certainly my time as being part of uh, EBI, uh, part of EMBL, which is across Europe, again, our working language is English, um, but our working culture is international. And so, uh, so I think that's, there's, a, there's a separate underlying thing to this about how we can ensure that very, very diverse people, without the best English, it really doesn't matter how good your English is, it's what your ideas are and how, how those come across uh, and can be used are the important things. Mm. I, I just might address quickly this final question uh, that's come up around the World Economic Forum because that is also a non-traditional boundary uh, across which we are currently working, and they've attended a number of global alliance meetings, but uh, we have a town team now working with them uh, in terms of looking at their assessment of the economic benefits of data sharing, which um, I, I actually think is going to add a, a, a great level of focus uh, to what we're doing because we, uh, as someone said, you know, we, we tend to focus on the H in Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, which we do, uh, but the, the benefits that we've all seen of these massive um, initiatives across data sharing are, are really going to reap an entirely different health system over the next uh, five to ten years. And thank you all for your fabulous um, talks, but I, I think uh, you make us all proud to be part of this. So thank you everyone and go and have some coffee.